Hi everyone. I'm Gary Naughton. I'd like to welcome you to this program. Today we are continuing with our series, Conversations with Remarkable Minds. My guest is Professor Harvey Cox. He is the Hollis Professor of Harvard Divinity School. That's the oldest professorship at Harvard going back to 1721. He has taught there since 1965 and just recently, just in the last few months, retired at age 80. Professor Cox has been called one of the most important liberal theologians during the last half century and a leading trend spotter in American religion. He has also been a prominent civil rights and anti-war activist throughout his career. His book, The Secular City, written back in 1965, was a surprise bestseller and predicted much of what we are slowly unfolding in large segments of society where dogmatic religious beliefs are dropping and making room for secular values that are in concert with the higher spiritual values of religion. In fact, even back then, Professor Cox viewed this as a maturing of humanity and a divine gift rather than a spiritual threat. Professor Cox recently timed his retirement with a new publication which mirrors back to the secular city. This book, The Future of Faith, The Rise and Fall of Beliefs in the Coming Age of Spirit, offers a new starting point to what has been happening in the past and where the current religious trends seem to be pointing in the future. Now, just a few thoughts, and we're going to go to this uh, individual who is standing by. He has always been at the forefront of what is known as the interfaith movement, the dialogue between the faiths to agree on where they are similar rather than how they differ. And although being religious, he views spirituality, um, although he would distinguish this from its common New Age usage, as compatible with secularism. In fact, he strongly favors the collapse of dogma to make way for a spiritual culture that focuses on higher values of civil justice, environmental sensibility, right livelihood, kindness, compassion, and all. All of the similar things Rabbi Abraham Lerner lists earlier in this week, and I believe that the two know each other. One of the main things my guest has focused on throughout the decades has been observing trends in religion and commenting about what they might be leading to in the future. Now, let's go over and say hello to Professor Harvey Cox. Nice to have you with us today, sir. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, first, just a few overview questions. And in the context of this program, I like to give rather broad-based questions and then sit quietly so that you have a chance to really lay out in proper context your thoughts. As the UN has been meeting, and as we've heard from people around the world, um, there has been very little real spiritual thought of how nations and people can unify into common positive work. Instead, there has been, well, you did this, and therefore we're going to do that. You're in denial of this, so we're going to do that. A lot of this political one-upmanship and that I feel is very counterproductive on everyone's part. If you were to give a talk today to every one of the world's leaders, what would you share with them that would give them a moment to pause specifically on this issue, the Israeli-Arab conflict, the Palestinian conflict, the conflict in Afghanistan, the conflict in Pakistan, the conflict in Iraq, Let's begin with those. <laughs> begin with those. <laughs> yeah, I can see why you give your uh, people you interview a long time to respond, Gary. That's uh, <laughs> not something easily packageable. Um, I think one of the things I'd want to say to the leaders is that uh, uh, the people are ahead of them. I really think the leaders now have to catch up with the changing popular sentiments uh, among and between especially religiously and spiritually committed people who are moving into a whole new phase in which uh, the, the traditional barriers between and among religions are now being viewed more and more as porous, as 
uh, and a lot of borrowing is going going on. And, uh, we we live in a time in which there's probably more intercommunication uh, among the various religious groups and traditions than any time in the in in the past. Uh, now, admittedly, there are pockets here and there in which the interaction is negative, destructive, intense, but I think they get a lot of attention. They're noisy and destructive, but the, uh, the sweeping seismic current around the world is, is something quite different. That's one of the things I, I discuss in my, in my new book, The Future of Faith, is that um, it's what I call, some people have referred to as the collage mentality. Uh, the, what has often happened at the level of theologies, where one thinker, or a Jewish or Muslim or Christian thinker, borrowed categories or ideas from others, has now become more or less democratized. So you have the uh, individual who maybe goes to church on Sunday morning, uh, goes to his yoga class uh, in the evening, uh, comes back and picks up a book by Trichnot Han or the Dalai Lama at his bedside table, or maybe read some Rumi. Uh, and uh, th this, this, uh, this utilization, or this mining of the different religious traditions uh, into one's own personal uh, uh, collage is a good word for it, I think, uh, is, is happening on a very widespread scale. And the, it is, of course, often opposed by religious leaders who like to think that you better, you, you have to take the whole package the way it's been wrapped and, and delivered for centuries and, and rather lose control when there's a much more direct access to the sacred. Now, I think that's really one of the meanings of, of the phrase one hears a lot of times nowadays. Somebody will say, well, I'm not really a religious person, but I'm, uh, I'm spiritual. I kept asking myself, what does that mean? Because I hear it all the time. And it means a lot of things. But one of the things it surely means is the unlinking of the quest for spiritual reality, for the sacred, from the institutional and doctrinal uh, wrappings uh, which uh, with which and in which it's been brought into brought to the uh, current period uh, people want something much much more direct something much more uh, accessible uh, and I think that that's happening now as far as the uh, uh, these various conflicts around the world that you mentioned uh, these are the points at which you might you might say some people seem not to have gotten the word. Uh, think about uh, the Palestinian-Israeli situation, which every poll shows that both Palestinians and Israelis are ready to make uh, a large range of compromises in order to have a peaceful uh, solution, uh, a two-state solution. They don't. Uh, they they may differ on what the details will be. But what we lack there, tragically, is uh, real imaginative and bold leadership at the spiritual and especially the political level, willingness to move ahead and actually do it. Uh, the, the same is true in the relations among Islamic, uh, between Islamic and, and Christians, and even within the Islamic world. Uh, the, the, uh, the people who are willing to kill for the faith uh, and not just die for it, are of course the ones who make headlines. And it doesn't take very many of them to make a lot of noise and to be very destructive and very dangerous, there's no doubt about it. But I think their, their star is setting, and something much more important and much more f sweeping is going on uh, among and between religious traditions uh, th that will eventually make a dent one hopes on the political leadership if they are not just uh, uh, don't give a, 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 a tin ear to all of this. Uh, one word then more about uh, about Afghanistan. We're all rightly concerned about Afghanistan and and 
the possibility of, of our being mired once again as Americans there. Um, one has to remember that uh, the the Islamic uh, radical Islamic movements in Afghanistan really began after the Soviet invasion in I think it was 1977, 78, when the United States quickly moved to arm and train, recruit, fund uh, not just uh, Afghans, but Arabs who would come in from other parts of the, the world to defend uh, Afghanistan. And right away, we suggested to them, we Americans suggested to these folks that this should be viewed as a holy war, a jihad. We called them Mujahideen, Mujahideen. Now, the word jihad is embedded in that word, Mujahideen. Uh, we, uh, some people have seen the movie called uh, Charlie Wilson's War, where he, he campaigned to have ground-to-air rockets uh, sent over there. They used them very effectively, and they not only used the rockets, they, used the, uh, they applied the ideology of, of jihad to ridding their country of the Russians. But once they had done that, it uh, dawned on them that they could uh, use the same kind of ideological, religio-ideological slogans and appeal uh, to recruit people and turn toward anybody who was uh, invading or occupying their country. Now, just about a week ago, more or less unnoticed uh, here in the United States, the guy who's the head of the Taliban, I think his name is Abdullah Omar, uh, issued a public statement in the form of a letter to uh, President Obama where he said, uh, you really ought to read the history of Afghanistan and pointed out that the Afghans have successfully repelled and hurled back uh, every invader since Alexander the Great. And they've all been there, uh, and they've all uh, failed. Uh, and there is no reason to think why uh, the present occupation and uh, effort by the by the United States, increasingly abandoned, by the way, in Afghanistan by any other allies, uh, should succeed where the others uh, have failed. Uh, I I think it's a situation. I think. We have to understand that we are in part responsible for sparking this kind of uh, radical Islam. We can't not take responsibility for that. But the good news is that throughout the Muslim world, uh, the opening toward other religions, including Christianity, and, which is my particular tradition, is wider and deeper, more serious. There are uh, conferences being held throughout both the West and the Islamic world, bringing together scholars. I've been to two or three of them so far uh, to sort through what it is precisely that we have in common uh, and try to uh, pare back the kinds of things that have sparked uh, violence uh, between our, our traditions. I think that's the major and most interesting and most by far the most important a trend that's going on, and I hope it uh, continues. I appreciate that overview. Thank you. Now, you have divided the course of Christianity into three periods, an age of faith in its earliest phase of faith that focused on living the teachings rather than theorizing what to be to believe about Jesus, then the age of belief, the longest period that built upon the walls of dogma, and finally, the age of spirit, starting about 50 years ago, which is a collapse of those walls, including the walls that divine humanity based on religious creeds. So I would like you to focus primarily on this transition between belief and spirit during the past 50 years and give us evidence that shows that we are now in this transition stage. And can you, in that uh that analysis give us an idea that the movement back to the environment, the mm -hmm. movement back to the earth, the movement to community-based um, agriculture, uh, the 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 living communes, the uh, the those individuals more often than not younger ones or older hippies, 
those are the two primary groups in my own personal experience who are willing to say, okay, if I'm going to live an authentic life, I should live it simply, honestly, mm. consciously, with reverence and awe, and show respect starting with everything that goes into my body. So if I'm going to eat some food, where did the food come from? Right, How was it right. grown? Was it grown humanely? Where I don't need to eat these animals. And, and if I'm going to uh, use something, am I just going to buy it and dispose of it in a highly consumeristic way? Or am I going to be conscious about what I buy, how I use it, where it came from, where it was made? If that kind of new thinking consumerist and a person willing to live more in harmony with the natural world, is that a part of any of this uh, spiritual awakening that you see? Yeah, well, let me, let me uh, respond to that uh, in two ways. One is the what I call the age of belief started about 300 years after the life of Jesus. For the first 300 years, there, there was no creed, there was no hierarchy, there was a vast variety of different expressions of Christianity, mainly concerned with following Jesus, being loyal to him, uh, calling him Kyrios, calling him Lord, which meant he was their ultimate authority and not, uh, not the emperor or something. That's why they got in so much trouble with the Roman Empire. But Christianity thrived and grew in all of the cultures of the of the Mediterranean period, uh, east and west, back into Syria and and uh, and Egypt, and west and north. Uh, then uh, a, vi a very dire event occurred in the early fourth century, in the 300s, when Constantine, seeing his empire fragmenting decided he really needed a unifying ideology, and he seized upon this vital, growing religion, Christianity, and really co-opted it uh, into the imperial ideology, I think in large measure by, in effect, buying off the uh, emerging group of, uh, of uh, bishops. Uh, he became their principal funder, he appointed and dismissed bishops. He insisted on a uniform creed, which is still used in some churches. It was concocted at a place called Nicaea, which was the emperor's summer palace. The, the uh, council there was not convoked by the bishops themselves. It was convoked by the emperor who presided over it, didn't know very much about theology, but knew he wanted something really unifying. So he insisted on this uh, this creed, and he sent any bishops who didn't uh, agree off into the uh, boondocks and decreed that their books should be burned. Uh, many of most of them were, but thank heaven, some of them were hidden. And one of the most remarkable things about the uh, period in which I've been uh, working in this field, of course, is the rediscovery after 1900 or well 1500 years of some of those uh, many of those texts in places like Nag Hammadi in Egypt, which indicate that the what we had before Constantine was a vast, variegated variety of different expressions. Nobody trying to enforce uh, of Christianity. Nobody trying to enforce uh, their views on anybody else. Then we went through this whole period of what I call the age of belief really contending creeds when, uh, and the burning of heretics and the banning of people and, this, and the schisms and all of the ugly history. Now, admittedly, throughout that period, there were wonderful personalities that emerged. One has only to think of uh, St. Francis of Assisi or uh, St. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila. There are many, many people, but uh, they were all, to some extent, swimming against the stream and had to watch out over their uh, their shoulders for the Inquisition or some other kind of enforcer of hierarchy and of, uh, of dogma. Then sometime, I'm, I'm dating it uh, in the late 19th, uh, early 20th century, we began to see the diminishing of that definition of Christianity based on creed and hierarchy. 
a lot of opposition to it. There are a lot of new movements emerging. So uh, as it has gathered speed, especially with Christianity now spreading all around the world, and uh, again, in fact, the fastest growing parts of Christianity are now in Asia, in Africa, the Asian Rim, South America, um, and not in the old precinct of Christendom in Europe and, and the United States. Um, uh, and, and in those areas, remember, Christians live cheek by jowl, week after week, year after year, with people of a variety of different religious uh, convictions, different, different symbol systems, and have learned to, to see that Christianity does have a unique message. We would all say that, that there's something unique and valuable about the message of, of Jesus. But it's not, it's not an exclusive message, and it's one that finds its, its place within other uh, unique expressions. That is the future of faith, in a nutshell. Now, a very important part of that is a rediscovery on the part of, here I would say again, Christians and people in other faiths, of the earth, the planet that we live on, as a gift to us, not as something we own, but as something we have a responsibility, a stewardship is the biblical term for it, to care for it, to nurture it, to love it, to respect it. Uh, and this is something which got very badly lost uh, through the whole period of, uh, uh, mostly through that period of hierarchical and dogmatic Christianity, which is so theoretical and not really very earthy. Uh, here we have a reemergence of, uh, of a rooted, grounded kind of way of thinking about uh, faith, in which how one lives one's life in this world, with this world, with, with other people and with other creatures, has become much more the focus rather than seeing this world as a kind of a preparation for some, some other world. There's, very, there's much, much, much less of that now. Uh, it's it's uh, living by faith in this world with a recognition, as the people in the social forum say, that another world is possible. By that they mean a way of living in this world and with this world, which is not the, the uh, uh, exorbitant and uh, destructive mode that we've had over the uh, last centuries of living in this world. Now let me just add something to that that might uh, uh, amuse you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, to mark my retirement uh, here at Harvard as Hollis Professor, uh, I discovered that the Hollis Professor has the privilege, traditional privilege, of grazing a cow in the Harvard yard. That was one of the original <laughs> perks of the, uh, of, the, <laughs> of the Hollis Professor. So I said, look, I'm going to uh, reclaim <laughs> that right. So I did, and two weeks ago I had a wonderful time here. I borrowed a lovely brown Jersey cow from a friend of mine who has a, uh, runs a farm school out in the middle of Massachusetts. You may know that. It's a wonderful place with precisely that philosophy that people ought to be both, people ought to be back in touch with where their food comes from, ought to be accustomed to living with the animals so we don't kill them and and uh, ought to be reminded almost on an hourly basis of uh, the, what sustains us in this world, which, which a lot of our uh, civilization has cut us off from. So I brought this cow. Of course, I had notified the Harvard security people beforehand and even got a little musical group to accompany this and brought the cow into Harvard Yard, and there she was grazing in Harvard Yard, bunching that grass, as cows had 200 years ago. And I made a little speech to hundreds and hundreds, if you can imagine, uh, undergraduates and others scurrying to their classes and stopping to see what this crazy professor in his red doctoral, crimson doctoral robe was doing. I said, look, it, it shouldn't be so odd to see a cow in Harvard Yard. Here she is. She looks very serene and content. And why shouldn't we have at least a couple cows here? Uh, if, if, uh, if Michelle Obama can have a, have a garden at the White House, we could, we could have something like this. 
and uh, there was a, you know there's an awful lot of uh, of applauding and 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 head nodding. So I intend to follow up on that. In fact, there are a couple students who've told me that they've already made arrangements with their residence houses to have gardens now in the in the yards or, or lawns of these houses. You know, uh, it reminds you of many things. It reminds you that we do rely on the soil and the earth uh, for our food, and it also ought to remind students who, who are preparing for leadership in large institutions that there are just lots of people in the world who aren't getting that food, uh, and they aren't getting it in part because we are we are we've fallen into the habit of eating food that comes from so far away that it's burning up the uh, the uh, resources and the uh, of the planet we already have now a farmers market right in the middle of uh, harvard right just right off harvard square um, or right off the harvard yard and uh, students are buying uh, buying food there and taking it back uh, there ought to be a lot more of that so I, I, you know, I, I think this is all of a, of a, it's all one picture. I think, Gary. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, cosmic size uh, trend, which is uh, picking up just a lot of people and not, and a lot of people in different religious traditions and some that don't particularly claim any one. I appreciate that. Thank you. Something that re- I recall from my childhood. Every meal began with saying grace. Mm-hmm. And I, I was always struck by uh, the sense of authenticity when that grace was said, because each time, each meal, someone else had to say it. Mm-hmm. And then we would go out to the country, and there I had an aunt that w- raised virtually all of the extended family on her farm, especially during the Great Depression. My mom and dad had to work there. And when she served food... The grace was always about giving thanks for where this food came from Mm -hmm. and being very specific. Uh, mm -hmm. And how people ate, they tend to eat slower. Mm -hmm. There was no gluttony. And er virtually everything that I saw, every time I went out there, she had raised on her farm. She was also vegetarian. Mm -hmm. She had chickens. They had uh, eggs, but she mainly used the chickens to get rid of the insects. And, And when I asked her once later... When I was older, how, why she kept her farm the way it was, because it was the only one like it. She did everything. She had beehives and orchards, and she had grains and beans and legumes and nuts and uh, fruit, and she dried stuff. I remember as a kid helping her dry apples. She'd cut the apples up and put them in thin strips, and we would lay them on this kind of cheesecloth and put another piece on it. And three days later, in the sun, it was dried, and she put them in a keg. Mm -hmm. She had at least a 100 different things going on. She said, well, she said there was a time when people would come around, and they would say, if you want to have a more profitable farm, buy this wheat or buy this corn, and we'll give you a guaranteed amount on the harvest. And she thought for a moment, she said, well, that sounds pretty good and pretty easy, but what happens all winter? What, what, what am I going to eat? And she says, now I can go into a, a cheese barn, and I have all kinds of cheese. I, I got vegetables and ciders. She said, I'd much rather be self-sufficient. Well, today, we are now finally seeing a reemergence of the self-sufficient homestead. We right. haven't seen that right. before. People didn't give thanks for the meals they're about to eat. To the contrary, they weren't even conscious of the food they were eating. They're watching a right. television on the cell phones right, right. and conversations. The food was merely an afterthought. Where do you believe that we can reconnect with what is sacred in our lives by starting with something that's relatively simple, something with just everyday living? Yeah, isn't, isn't it remarkable that uh, at the, uh, the central ritual of, of almost every religion has to do with food, with eating, with fasting, with eating again, with blessing the food, with, share, with sharing the food. Uh, and very often that, the, the, the powerful meaning of those, let's call it, uh, those sacraments uh, have been lost. I mean, we just finished uh, Ramadan where uh, for a whole, uh, nearly a month, uh, Muslims do not eat during the day. They eat in the evening and then have a, uh, a wonderful feast at the end. 
that makes you appreciative of food. Uh, if you, if you, uh, fasting has a way of doing that. You know, it, it and uh, I couldn't agree more that the uh, the, uh, the fast food, uh, watch the television uh, while you eat business has has enormously desensitized us. But also being away from where that food comes from. You know, I was really pleased that when we had the cow over in the yard last two weeks ago, students asked rather shyly at first, was anybody going to milk it? And I said, well, would you, li- would you like to? We had a line of students, most of them had never seen a cow milked, let alone done it. And this wonderful farm school guy who showed them, you know, how you take, take hold of those teats and how you steer it toward the bucket. And, and they, they now have a feeling, not just intellectually, but in their fingers and body for something that they may have mainly just sort of poured out of a carton. Now they now they have some idea of where it comes from, and I, uh, I think that link has to be made at something other than simply the, the conceptual level. That's why I'm pretty serious advocate for having uh, a very serious one, for having, I I want I want to see corn and and radishes and and uh, fruit trees growing here and animals here, and uh, I I may not get it all, but I'm going to get some of it. And Harvard will Harvard will look different if uh, enough students and faculty get behind this, and the mentality that it produces will be different. Thinking about your grace for a moment, uh, uh, our family still says grace. We don't give that up. Uh, they know that we're going to do that, and 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 we we say it. I always ask them when we have a huge family gathering. Think about something you're really thankful for. Uh, and, you know, the traditional one is bless this food to the use of our bodies, but that always ends, and make us ever mindful of the needs of others. Uh, that's, that's the traditional uh, grace prayer before uh, eating food. Now, it may become a little rote or just ritualized, but you can't say that all the time and not occasionally think uh, of the needs of others. Uh, but when it's when it's completely desacralized, deritualized, and it just becomes uh, something you uh, you uh, open up and pour and, and eat while you're thinking about something else, maybe you, uh, not, you know, maybe even so many people eat alone now uh, uh, that it's 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 not a communal event, and we we it, and something very very important has been lost in that way. I still believe we should. I say grace even when I eat alone, which is most of the time. I believe that we should never for a second in our lives abrogate the gifts of life and the fact that we have food in that moment when you especially think of all the people who do not. Right, right. And then how could you possibly gluttonize uh, when you realize there are people who have no food that meal? In the, in the United States, there are 40 million who are now officially um, hungry each day. They're not getting adequate nutrition. I only right. have two, two more questions for you. That's in the United States of America, 40 million. Yeah, that's in the United States. That's the latest statistics as of Tuesday of this week. 40 million Americans yeah. are now, 12 million of those are children who are not getting enough to eat each day. So I believe that we should be more conscientious of where food comes from because we have the resources. We have both the human resources of intellect and will. We have the environmental resources. We're just not combining the two to see that this gets done. And I believe that we must show by example. I'm going to be purchasing a farm this year to use as a homestead, a teaching homestead, Mm -hmm. so people from all over the United States can come and learn how to create homesteads, to go back to the earlier part of our history where every home was a homestead and where people did honor the earth. In any case, my last two questions. Recently, I was um, in Colorado on a public television station, and uh, of all things, I was introducing a a new documentary I did called Overcoming the Dark Side, and then another one called... uh, Oh, uh, embracing our soul, which was very well received. And I passed this gigantic church, 
And the driver says, oh, there's one of the busiest places here. And I said, well, tell me about it. I hadn't seen it before. He said, well, it's one of these big uh, televangia places. They get uh, over 10,000 people. And, and I said, have you gone there? Oh, yeah, I've gone there. What's it about? And once he explained from his perspective what it was about, I started thinking the one down in Dallas, the one in Atlanta, the one in Washington. I've been, seen these and been to some of them because I was interested in what it is. And it's more like bread and circus uh, for those who are using religion and the dogma of religion and the spectacle of that as a way of um, uh, solidifying their faith. There's nothing subtle about it. I mean, the, these people are more flashy than Reverend Ike here in New York, mm-hmm. and I knew Reverend Ike. Um, very, you know, uh, the gigantic screens and hundreds of millions yeah. of dollars. And a lot of that has gone off to the religious right. And with that comes the faith-based initiatives. And with that comes people who are voting for legislation that affects all Americans, secular, uh, non-spiritual, spiritual, and religious, and dogmatic religious, and the rapturist. Uh, in the end of times, uh, as as if their religious beliefs should be mandated as law to everyone. I have a concern about this. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, uh, uh, I have a concern about that, too, of course. Uh, the the so-called uh, megachurches are uh, a very mixed, very mixed bag. And I've been studying, I have a couple students who are working on projects about the megachurches, they, they vary quite widely from one place to another. Now, there's no, no doubt about it, there's an element of spectacle there. People sort of like spectacles. I mean, there's the Super Bowl, and there's the, I don't have to go on, and religion has always had its element of spectacle. Uh, what is it that attracts people to such a large gathering? Well, take, uh, for example, Saddleback Church in uh, Southern California. Uh, uh, I've studied that pretty carefully. It isn't just the fact that there are a lot of people there. All those people are very strongly encouraged to get into a small group sponsored by the church. There are groups that do uh, tutoring uh, in the inner city. There are groups that uh, run aid, uh, uh, um, food pantries and, and shelters. Oh, then there are other groups that are of prayer groups and book discussion groups, and but they're mainly ministry, what they call ministry groups. The emphasis is getting out there and trying to do some good uh, in your community, and they, at least at Saddleback, they make it pretty uncomfortable for you if you just enjoy the big show and don't uh, enroll in one of these groups. And if you walk onto that, uh, it's really like a big campus there, in California, there are all these um, uh, booths that are where you can sign up for one of these groups. Uh, they also have a variety of different what they call uh, tents where you can uh, participate in the service. You'll find this rather funny, I think, if you like classical music or if you like uh, if you like the old hymns or if you like uh, if you like uh, gospel or spirituals, you choose a particular tent where that music is, is used, and then when the sermon comes on, it comes on in a screen, and everybody has the same sermon, but the, uh, the, uh, it's, it's a, um, a, a, a variable approach to it. Uh, now, now, some of them are indeed uh, very conservative politically, uh, but they tend to be not fundamentalist. And the reason why most of them are not fundamentalist is that they know what appeals to a large audience. And you can't keep railing uh, about particular doctrines, or especially sort of end-time scenarios like you referred to, and you can't be uh, railing against uh, uh, gays and, and expect to have people uh, subscribe and, and and for example uh, the the big church down there in Dallas the uh, preacher there simply gave up years ago talking about talking against gays because he said young people are just not interested in hearing that they just know too many people including their own uncle Harry and their cousin Bill uh, and they don't want to hear that kind of stuff so I, I think one should be careful uh, to reserve judgment because they, they, they vary from place to place. 
Okay, so, well, I just wanted your input mm -hmm. because it is a phenomenon. And my last question, um, and we're running out of time, and if, if you could just uh, consolidate your thought on this, I would really appreciate it. I have been asking all of my recent guests in this series why there is a lack of authentic protest based upon spiritual values against injustices we are witnessing by government and corporations, the Wall Street monopoly, the wars in the right. Middle East. Surely we are not seeing anything like we witnessed in the 60s among the baby right. boomers. Yep. We had Sheldon Wolin on the air Monday. I'm sure you're familiar with him. And, um, and so we want to know your perspective. Well, I've asked myself that same question. Uh, yesterday, we had here a, a group of students, about 40 students that came together to talk with a, a guy who'd been a veteran of the uh, Civil Rights Movement and worked with uh, Dr. King, reminding us that Dr. King's uh, real emphasis toward the end of his life was on economic justice, uh, the Poor People's Campaign and, and some of the other things that he did. Uh, and uh, they, the, the students thought this really ought to be the next next step. Uh, it's uh, why don't you know co confronting Wall Street. You know, uh, you know, if if I were a person who's been out of work now for three months and and I, I and my my unemployment's running out, and I picked up the paper and saw that the the banks have not changed one bit. The banks and big investment houses are still at it. They're still uh, they're still trafficking in these very questionable uh, uh, derivatives, products. and they're and they're giving these gigantic bonuses to people. I mean, I th I, I I think one of the reasons, maybe the main reason, why we we can't seem to get it together to have the equivalent of a civil rights movement and protest against this gross injustice is people seem to be saturated. With with information and uh, and and uh, uh, everybody's walking around with something glued to his or her ear. It's either an iPod or a, a cell phone. The the flow of information and misinformation coming in kind of uh, sedates people, and they can't seem to focus. And this is true of my students here as well. On a particular uh, pick a particular thing, long enough to sort of get it together and organize and, and go for it. Now they did. They did certainly for Obama. I mean, there's an awful lot of, uh, of um, really quite remarkable uh, organization on the part of young people and students during that. But then they sort of sat back, said, "Well, we've elected this guy. Now we can, we can, you know, we can turn on our iPods again." Uh, I think that may be a large reason for it. Okay, I really appreciate your work um, and the book, "The Faith Future of Faith: The Rise and Fall of Beliefs in the Coming Age of Spirit." And congratulations on one of the longest careers at Harvard and now your new retirement. Well, thank you. Thank you. Professor Harvey Cox, the Hollis Professor of, at Harvard Divinity School, the oldest professorship at Harvard, and uh, my guest today.